Yeah, so so. How did you what, come into contact with Tommy? Okay, so let, let, start from the very beginning. When I came out of prison, I, I was in a tag house. Um, I was in a tag house for six. I did the rest of my sentence in a tag house. Tag house, yeah. Um, and um, I ended up leaving the tag house and coming coming back down to, to Portsmouth Way. And um, I ended up starting a business, um, sell, selling websites. So I was selling websites. Um, made it really successful, really. Um, and it, if it wasn't for the situation with Tommy, I'd probably still be going at it now. But it's uh, basically what happened was is that when when Tommy uh, did a, a banned speech by a guy from Austria, I think it's Austria. I, I might have that wrong, but it, he, um, Martin Selner, he was denied entry into the UK to give a speech in Speaker's Corner. Um, and because of that, Tommy took it upon himself to take that speech, go down to Speaker's Corner on the day that he was supposed to do it, and he was going to read the speech. That was the first time I'd ever seen Tommy in person. I'd heard of Tommy beforehand. My dad and my mum watched him. Um, I knew about him. I knew about the EDL. I was never part of the EDL, never part of any movement of the EDL at all. State, do you want to state that twice just for the people? Oh, no, I don't mind. <laughs> the earlier days of the EDL were very much had the right message, but what it turned into when Tommy left, yeah. I, I've got no sympathy for any of them. I think they, they, they did some stupid stuff and they made it into what, it, what it's known as today. Yeah, yeah. But the original EDL that Kev Carroll and Tommy that made, they had the right message. They were looking to protect their own uh, something that the police were refusing to do. So, yeah, so back down in Speaker's Corner, I got a real feel for this guy. It was like um, I could see people's faces, you know, young young men that were besotted by him and looking at him like a leader because they, they were turning to seeing their country in a, in a certain light, a lot of information being fed to them about certain things that were happening. And Tommy was the only voice willing to say what needed to be said. And people loved that about him. So seeing that in Speaker's Corner and then obviously... We all know the story of Tommy going to Leeds and um, and going outside the court and then yeah. Tommy being arrested. Tommy is the first man in the UK to be um, to, to to have that happen to him where he is um, a judge, tells the police to go outside, he is arrested, he is um, taken to court, he is convicted and he is sentenced and sent to prison awesome. all in the same day. Um, and they made it very... Tom. People don't know, they, they re refused to allow Tom to talk to his lawyer they, they, they didn't let him, they didn't plea. They're saying, that, that a lot of the reports are, oh, I plead, pleaded not guilty, I pleaded guilty. He never pleaded, he never pleaded. So this has happened. Everyone knows that it was a massive, massive thing. And obviously when that happened, um, one of the things that I, I was part of was being on social media and seeing this happen. And I got a real feel in myself, like there was a talk about going down to Downing Street, going and making your voices heard. So I did, I did exactly that. I'd only been out of prison a very short space of time. Um, went down to Downing Street, and when I got there, there was just groups of maybe two, three hundred people at the start with. We were just screaming, you oh, know, we want Tommy out. We want Tommy out. But I couldn't see any organisational side of things there. That Everyone was like here, there and everywhere. No, nothing was really uh, planned. You know, the message was there, but the message wasn't being shown properly. So I took control of it in a sense where there's an iconic picture of me that I find iconic anyway, that where I was stood on the, the gates of Downing Street are here. Then there's another set of gates just before it. And I stood up on the on the on those gates, and I put my fist up in the air, and all these people started raring about it, and I, you know, and I started taking a, a microphone on a loudspeakers, and I started talking about how much of an injustice is, and what we need to do is continue to continue this until he's out, and then I could see the police surrounding everyone. They started kettling everyone in, and I could see that happening. And I said, so I got the megaphone. I said, everyone sit down. So I thought, right, if everyone sits down, it's very difficult to move three, four, five hundred people when they're all sat down. So everyone sat down. And it lasted for a few few hours. And then when everyone went home, the burning sensation of achievement, mm. even only minimal, was so strong within me that I then spent the evening just looking around. What's, what's next? You can't just leave it at that. What's going on? So what I did was, is I took the initiative to start an event. Uh, I wanted to do an event, a protest in Downing Street. Um, and I started a Facebook event. And I started it. It was a free Tommy, free Tommy event. Um, started it, put it on the internet, on Facebook. Within an hour, it had 10 people. I was like, oh, bloody hell, 10 people. Two hours, 20 people. Later that night, about 11 o'clock, it was 1,000 people. I was like, bloody hell, this has gone quick. Woke up the next morning, it was 5,000 people. That afternoon, it was 10. Then the next day, it was 20,000, 30,000. I was like, whoa. So now I'm thinking, okay, 
everyone's looking at me like, he's the event organiser. What are we doing? So then I had to sit there and think, okay, how am I going to do this? So I came up with a plan. I came up with speaking to a, 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 um, a st- I wanted a stage. So what I did was, is I, I got hold of a, sc- a scaffolding company. I said, you know, Tom Robinson? Yeah, yeah. I said, you're local to London. Do you mind putting up some scaffolding so I can stand on it? So like, yeah, no problem. So, he, I was, so I thought, right, there's a, there's a stage sorted. So I was going to say, did Tommy know you personally at no, this time? No, at so. that time, no. Never, never met him. Only met him once in Speaker's Corner. Then next thing I had, one of the, one of the best, probably the best people I've ever met, in the terms of the movement was, was Tommy's cousin, Kev Carroll. I was very close to Kev. Um, still, still out. Um, I haven't spoken to him for a while, but, but very close. Um, he, uh, and he's got a great character about him. So, so what's the plan then? And I said, well, this is what I've written up so far. And, he, and then, it, 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 obviously, the, 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 we were down the street in, say, May. I think it was May. The, the event was organised for June the 6th, 7th, 8th, something like that. And then I had a phone call from a, 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 someone that sounded like they're from Dutch. Hello? They were like, oh, Danny. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah. Was a, we're the Secret Service from Holland. We were part of the Secret Service. I said, okay. They said, we've got a, a Dutch politician that wants to come and talk at this event. And I said, okay. And they said, Geert Wilders. Now, Geert is a very controversial Dutch politician, very liked, but he is constantly under threat of murder by extremists. Like, Constantly, he has to have people at his house all the time, can't walk with anywhere. So now I've got the Secret Service. I've gone from like just doing an event on Facebook to now having the Secret Service from Holland ring me and saying, okay, who are you? We need to do a background check. This is what he wants to do. Can you guarantee it? This is this, this is this. So then the next thing I get is I get a phone call from from uh, Gerard Batten's people, who is the currently the leader of, uh, of UKIP. You know, we want to speak as well. So it's gone from like, and I'm thinking, I've only got a bit of scaffolding. <laughs> I've only got a bit of scaffolding coming up. And now suddenly like, I've got all these like mega in, uh, you know, politicians. Then the maddest one turns up is I get a phone call from America. Hello, is that, is that Danny? I was like, yeah. He said, uh, we've got a congressman that wants to come over. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? I've never done this before. I don't know. And they just wanted the, the information about who's going to be there. Who, what are your security things? So one of the things... Sorry, during this time, is this is this picking up media attention as well? Oh, massively. This, yeah, 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 yeah. Every, everywhere. So, so people don't know yeah, where it's going to come. The far right are descending on central London on June. Stay away. This is a, so the, so the, the thing that was quite difficult was dealing with the council of Westminster. So you can imagine, hi there. Yeah, I'm looking at doing an event with 50,000 people in Westminster. We want to put a stage in the middle yeah. of a uh, scaffolding stage in the middle of the uh, outside Downing Street. Is that all right? Uh, no. So then they were like, well, you have to fill out these forms, all these forms. And I said, do you know what? I turned, the, turned it and I said, I'll tell you what, I have 50,000 people coming to, to, to Downing Street on this day. If you don't give me what I want, you're going to have carnage. And then suddenly I had a high ranking police officer, met the police calling me saying, what do you need? What do you want? We're going to bypass the council. So then I realised on the first one, I thought, if this is going to work on the first one, I didn't realise it's going to end up working for all of them because a lot of people used to ring me and say, well, we were looking at doing an event. How do you do it? I said, just tell them you're going to bring loads of people there. And if you don't, they don't do what you tell you they're going to do, <laughs> you're just going to, you're going to cause chaos. So then the next thing is I get uh, an American think tank contact me and they say, um, hmm. we understand that you haven't, you haven't really got any funds for this. What's your plan? And I said, well, I've got some scaffolding. A couple of guys coming up with some scaffolding. They said, what if we can give you some money to make it what it needs to be? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, what, what are you talking? Five, ten? Well, we can, 30,000 can be on the table. Uh, okay, 30,000 pound. I thought, well, that changes things. So then I started dealing with, with proper security companies. Um, I won't say a name, but there's someone close to Tommy that's been, been a really good friend of all of ours for many years. For way before even I was involved, but he's got a security company. He was then put in, in, in for the security. They can't, they're not going to work for free. There's a big risk on these mm-hmm. days. We had to pay for the security. The stage, the stage was really expensive. I mean, the sound system that we use was on par with something from like, um, concerts. concerts. Yeah. So they were expensive. Um, and then watching the, yeah. So watching all this happen, I'm, I, I'll be honest. I was, I was on a stag do in Ibiza mm. for my uncle and I get a call to say, Oh, the funds are available. So I'm looking in my bank and there's 30, Sniff. there's this 30,000 pounds. And I'm <laughs> thinking, okay. do, the oh. right, do what you said you're going to do. Yeah, do yeah. the right thing. Can don't, imagine. don't be an idiot. So I did, I did, I'll clear yeah, And the, One of the things that actually probably went in my favor was the bank actually clo- um, uh, 
stop the transactions to go into anyone to anyone I couldn't do anything yeah. with the money because they were like well where have you just got why is the thirty thousand pounders here they're going to question you, they wanted to know where it come from so yeah so now you're in a point where I've gone from just standing outside down the street, putting my hand up in the air, saying a few things on the microphone, telling people to sit down, to now being the main organiser of this huge, massive event with all politicians from around the world, including, you know, um, some really high level speakers from Australia, from all different places of the world. Mm. And, and, I, and, and it worked. It worked so well. But there was always this doubt, well, who is he? Who are you? And where yes. have you come from? Uh, this is, yeah. Yeah, so, so one of the things that did happen was my... my Certain family members were took, took in the back of Range Rovers in the Midlands and questioned by some heavy people um, who I later, later became very good friends with uh, to say, who is your nephew? Is it true he went to prison? Has he ever been involved with the MI5? I mean, they thought I was MI5. They thought I was an undercover police officer. They thought uh, that this is a great blag. They've managed to get an undercover police officer or an MI5 agent to become the main organiser for Tommy Robinson. You do so, sound like a knight in shining <laughs> armour. Like yeah, Tommy is it, it, was, to it was too good to be true at that point. And one of the people that really didn't believe that I was who I was, it was Kev Carroll at the beginning. And later on in life, you know, later on all that, he used to go, oh, I'm so sorry, bro. I, I used to call you everything. <laughs> I used to call you this, that, the other. I thought you were a police officer. Never, they never used to want to go have a drink with me but at the very, very beginning because they, they thought I was you know, secretly recording or more. Yeah. Um, so that's how it sort of began. But it was a mad story to go from just doing a little protest and now suddenly seeing, yeah. you know, and the day itself was to see 50,000 plus people. I'm, imagine I'm on the stage. I've got Gerard Batten here. I've got Gerard Geert Wilders here. I've got all the, the congressmen stood there. And as Geert Wilders come down down the street, they had to be armed police. So you had a a, a, a circle of armed police walking Gerard, Gerard um, the guy for the Dutch politician down Downing Street, all holding guns, walking him down because he was so wanted. He was so scared, not scared, concerned that he was going to get attacked by the extremists in the UK. So then watching this wave of fifty thousand people, it just didn't stop. It was just waves and waves and then they started turning on the police so i got on the speaker i'm like we're not here for this you know they obviously you can imagine what type of people there they were they were the, the concerned people they were also the football lads and then they were the idiots this was the first time i'd ever seen the football firms around the country come together you're talking Mirwall, west ham we stood next to each other all together as one very rare to see that and and and, and every yeah. firm was there um something that i've i've never seen happen and something i don't think i'll ever see happen again Unfortunately, yeah. I've, se I've seen the one documentary. Uh, I think it's Scrubs. It's one of the prisons, and 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 Tommy's in prison. Yeah, and you can Bell hear the Marsh. protesting outside. Yeah, so I was that, that protest, or was that another protest? No, so that was. Uh, if you watched the ITV documentary, I actually got interviewed by Ross Kemp for that. That's right. Yeah, so I organised that one. Um, I went to see Tommy in prison first. Um, shell of shell of himself. Yeah. What people don't get to see is the reality of what all of this does to Tommy as a person. His mental health is is been up and down dramatically for a long, long time. You know, he, since he start since he started the EDL, he's he's been dragged through the court system with bogus stuff since then, and the mental effect it had on him and his family is something no one ever sees, and they don't realise that for a guy to go through everything that he goes through and to keep going, you know, I walked away, which I'll go into a little bit why I walked away. I had to step back from the activism. But to have everything that happened to him, to him to go, um, you're not going to get me. You're not going to stop me because I know what I'm saying and what I'm doing is the right thing. And only recently has it been proven everything Tommy said since them days with the grooming gangs, with the Pakistani gangs, everything is true. And he was a conspiracy. There is no Pakistani grooming gang. Grooming gangs don't exist. This is what they pushed. This is what the media pushed. This is what uh, he was, you know, this is what mm. they tried to do to him to break him. And everything's now coming out as absolute truth. But yeah, mental health for him is, 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 and, I, and I, I've seen him in some really bad states, really, really bad states. Um, how do you feel when people call him a racist? I got, I, I just think about all the times we've been out in Luton and, 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 and there's more black and black lads with us than there is white lads. Like his, his friends group are, uh, like I would say 70% are black. Like he's, he, he, one of his best friends who we get up, he used to get, make me get up at five in the morning, out in the car, quarter past five to go to the gym. The main lad that we used to go to every day is, is black. It's, 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 it's actually lost its touch now. I don't think a lot of people realise that these labels, racists, 
are just so thrown around as blasé these days. It's actually done them a bit of a favour mm. because people are starting to see, especially when they watch the documentaries and they listen to him, especially the Oxford speech. If anyone that hasn't seen it, the Oxford speech it is, yeah. is, it explains everything. Um, so when they call him racist, we, we have to get away from that. We have to get away from it affecting him or affecting us. Um, but it's laughable because it, it, it's, it, it's not true. It's 100% not true because I've seen him do things for people that are not white. Yes. And, 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 and if someone's racist, they, they wouldn't treat people. Would you say he's Islamophobic? I think he's got concerns, rightly so, mm. about the religion of Islam. There's a, there is a definite difference between the religion and people. Tommy talks about the, the Prophet Muhammad. He talks about uh, Islam as a religion. Mm -hmm. talks about the problems that that uh, brings when, when, when certain people follow it by the book. Um, when we went to Telford and, and, and spoke to the survivors and the victims, the things that they were saying to us, which resonated with the fact that they were going by, that they felt because they were Muslim, because they were following the Islamic faith, because Muhammad says these things in the Quran, that they were able to do these things to young white English girls, aging from 10 up to whatever age they are. And they and, and when Tommy sees that, and he sees the, the, the places in Luton that are completely unrecognisable, and um, it's all down to it's all down to a certain immigration coming in. And listen, he, he hasn't got a problem with Muslims. He's got a problem with the, the extremist Islamic preachings, teachings, and and followers that follow it by a certain way. I mean, there's no coincidence that the severest terrorist attacks around the world are Islamic because there's a reason for that. There's a reason why a, a town like Telford, who has a 3% population of pa uh, Pakistanis, are 95% the, uh, you know, the convictions are for, for Pakistani men, for, for, for street grooming. So one thing that people don't distinguish, they go, oh yeah, there's those are white people. Yes, we're, in, we're a white country. So there's there's two different types of grooming. There is, gro there is grooming that's predominantly by middle-aged white men done on social media, done through the internet. That is a fact. Mm -hmm. And there, is, there are police uh, groups, there are um, task force that go after these, that pretend they're, 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 they're young girls to get these men. Yeah, if you see there's, paedophile hunters and Yeah, all paedophile that. hunters, yeah. So I've it's, never it's seen well an known. Asian guy really. Yeah, like. it's, well, it's well known. It's well known. And the, the, there's tacklings through the police force. The problem is that what, what we, we've seen, what Tommy's seen for a long period of time is the police actually didn't do anything when they had the evidence planted on their desk. Mm. They allowed young girls to be violently tortured, violently raped, gang raped by, by multiple men with even being branded with, a, with, a, with, a, with an iron of M to say that they're Muhammad's property. You know, they, they, there's such severe torture and systematic rape that the problem we had and the reason why we didn't stop is because no matter how much you tarnish Tommy, the how much you say these, these things, he's the only man that continued from the EDL days leading up to even today that stood up, put his head above the water and said, this is what's happening. This is what they're doing. And now all the police forces have been on investigation. You know, you look at all these places yeah, where these investigations right. are happening. They, everything that Tommy said was true. And look what they did to him. Mm. And now you've got people that are trying to, like even even GB News, we thought GB News was going to be different. We thought GB News was going to be a little bit different, and they were going to they were going to tackle things. They 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 haven't even interviewed. Tommy's done like five documentaries on 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 Pakistani grooming gangs. And I'm not talking not just sitting there. I'm just talking about you know in detail documentaries. Going actually, what one thing that Tommy doesn't do? If one person says something to Tommy about a grooming gang, he'll never never believe them. In a sense, he does where, his due diligence. He does doesn't what he? he does is. It has to be three people that don't know each other, all mentioning the same name, the same sort of locations and the same offences. So, sorry, I didn't mean to say he didn't believe him at first, but he won't take it for face value. He'll wait till three individuals, yeah. three girls say the same things and then he'll give them their right to reply and then they can't say anything. And even with all this, we, we had evidence and we said to the police, we have a dossier of information. Yeah. Just pass it to a police officer. So I'm not doing that. We know, we've got evidence yes. that police were working with the grooming gangs to prevent them from being convicted. You've also got one came out yesterday. In the, in the, West, in the, in the Midlands, a, a police officer, it's on my Twitter feed, there's a police officer that actually told a child rapist that they were coming for him and allowed him to flee to Pakistan and he's now not been arrested. We were told the same type of information. There were envelopes being passed under the counter to, because of these grooming gangs, they, they own all the businesses. They run the towns. Yeah. So they were paying big money 
for these coppers to go, well, we haven't got enough evidence. And thousands and thousands of, our, of daughters of England have suffered under the hands of these police forces. And till, till this day, not one police force really has been taken to, to town to, 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 to actually get something categorically said, like, you are to blame, this person is to blame. And these girls have, have suffered immensely and they continue to. This isn't stopped. It's still going on now, 100%. The Central Club.